Welcome to the Niche Pursuits Podcast. Are you ready to discover some niche business ideas that actually work? Well, it's time for a motivational kick to jumpstart your next big idea. Here's your host, Spencer Haas. Hey everyone, Spencer here and welcome to another Niche Pursuits Podcast. I'm going to be joined today by Nathan Hartnett an entrepreneur that owns several niche e-commerce stores. But what I find interesting is that Nathan was an air traffic controller in Australia for many years before he started his current business. Today we're going to discuss how he went from directing air traffic to generating Google traffic for his online business and what he has learned along the way. So Nathan, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Spencer. Yeah, I appreciate you taking your time uh, out of your day to discuss your business with us. Um, I'm I'm very interested in digging into your background a little bit and how you went from point A to point B, if you will. Um, so tell us a little bit about your background. What was your career like before you started selling online? Well, I was an air traffic controller in the Australian Air Force, actually, for many years. Um, and it was obviously a very quite an interesting job, um, something different. Uh, many people sort of think that it's quite a stressful job, and I guess in some ways it was. Um, but really, I'd always dreamed, of, I was a bit of a traveler, and always dreamed of, of having some kind of form of income where I could travel around the world and live wherever I wanted to. It was actually my inspiration for be, becoming an air traffic controller in the first place, because I had heard that there was a bit of a worldwide shortage and that you could get sort of positions in different countries fairly easily. Okay. Um Unfortunately, the whole shift work uh, and and the whole nine to five thing, when it when it, you know when it wasn't shift work, it just I don't know. I, I guess I always had bigger dreams for that for for what I wanted to do, and I and I really started to figure out that that my number one goal was to be able to decide what I did when I got out of bed in the morning, mm-hmm. no matter where that was, just to be able to say, okay, yes, um, today I want to have the day off, or no, I want to work a bit, you know work on something that I'm passionate about. And air traffic control wasn't it. Now, we we exchanged uh, a few emails prior to this interview, and in in one of those emails, you, you mentioned that I mean, it sounded like the career that you were leading was actually um, it paid quite well. Uh, you were offered one hundred sixty thousand dollars a year, if I'm not mistaken, back in two thousand and six. But uh, you still decided to walk away from that. Um, you know, is that accurate, and why did you do that? That is accurate. Uh, in basically, where I was in, in the Air Force, we were on about $100,000 a year, um, and the Air Force sort of started making big plans for my life and my career, Okay. Um, as they tend to do, that I didn't necessarily agree with. I had, I had, if, you know, without getting too, too romantic, I had just met a girl who's now my wife, and uh, they really basically wanted me to... to to leave her, basically, in many ways, that's what I would have had to have done. Uh, so I looked at the civilian side of things, and I already knew that the civilians paid a lot more. Um, so I went for an interview, and unfortunately, the position it was one hundred sixty thousand, and I was successful in the interview. But the position again was uh, in Melbourne, and I was currently uh, several thousand kilometres away from Melbourne, where again, where this girl was, um, and. And I, and I had also started thinking to myself, when I first joined the Air Force, I'd said, four years, uh, if I'm not overseas, then I need to review what I'm doing. And I'd already been in the Air Force for six years, and now I was looking at this this other job, which sounded sort of fantastic, but the only fantastic thing about it was this 160000 And I started questioning, you know, well, you, you kind of only get one life. Um, the 160000 was the safe bet. Everybody thought that was amazing, but... What 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 were my days going to look like, you know, when I got up in the morning? And again, it just wasn't getting me closer to where I wanted to be. So I know a lot of people think that's probably crazy. But, um, <laughs> and, I, and I'll be honest, I haven't earned that amount of money since. But I tell you what, my life has been just amazing, and and so much better than it would have been. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, it, it does sound. I mean, it's a lot of money um, to to be able to walk away from. And so it sounds like you're a bit of a dreamer, a bit of a romantic, if you will. You, <laughs> you, you fell in love uh, with, with somebody and, you know, I'm married and so I completely understand where you're coming from. 
Um, and you really just want, you had an ideal lifestyle, if you will. Um, it sounded like you wanted to be able to travel. You wanted to be close to your, uh, your girlfriend, your soon to be wife. Um, and so you chose a different path. And, um, was it right after that in 2006 that you started, um, selling things on eBay and jumped into that business? And if so, tell us a little bit about that. No, what happened is when they offered me the job, they said, okay, we need to put you on a basically a bridging training course to go from uh, the military to civilian. And it was basically the next course was in about sort of seven or eight months' time. So what I did is I thought, okay, well, I've got at least seven or eight months to 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 find something, anything, you know, to, if, I, if I'm going to do this, then I need to do it now. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's when I started looking, okay, well, online, to be honest, I mean, if you want to be able to travel and live in different countries, then doing something online clearly makes a lot of sense. Um, but I didn't really know where to start. Uh, I had a friend who had a sewing shop, and she was selling sewing machines to France on eBay. I thought, that's really odd. <laughs> Why is someone yeah, who's right. trying to sell sewing machines to France on eBay? Turned out there was there was some tax in France on sewing machines. We're not not quite sure how it worked, but it just worked out cheaper for for people in France to buy sewing machines overseas. Um, so they were buying them online, mm-hmm. um, exactly the same, you know, all the same brands, same parts, whatever. But uh, I thought that's curious. Okay, so I'll start with eBay. Uh, and one of the the unique things about eBay is that you can search for completed listings, so you can see. What people are selling are actually selling. How many they sell? What their conversion rate is and what their prices are. Right. So you can actually sort of, I guess, you can have a look at the market. You can see what people are actually looking for and what they're buying. So I thought, well, that's probably the best place to start because I can actually find a market before finding a product. Mm -hmm. So what did you find? Uh, I found well, jewelry was the number one selling thing on eBay. Okay. I like the idea of jewelry just because it's small. It's uh, easily shipped around the world. And so I started looking, okay, well, where, where, you know, I don't really know the first thing about jewellery. Um, but I started looking, okay, if, I, if I'm going to source product, everybody you know, sort of seems to go to Asia for product. So I thought, okay, I need to figure out how to find supplies in Asia and, and how to send money and how not to get ripped off and all that kind of stuff. So I just, I just started doing it. I just started sending out emails and... And I eventually found a couple of suppliers, and so I just figured out, went down to the bank and said, how do I send money to China? And uh, they gave me all these forms to fill out, so I did that. And um, I didn't actually have an internet connection at home at that point. I was doing air traffic control and then going to an internet cafe after work for a couple of hours. <laughs> so it was definitely an interesting time. Um, but then we, you know, we started selling things on eBay. And... And and it just basically everything is grown from that. Okay, so a lot of interesting things there that we could probably dig into. I I do want to move on to some other things, but um, so so you were doing this on the side. Um, you you started to source product out of Asia, and I'm sure that's a huge learning process. Um, I wouldn't even know where to begin um, to to do something like that. But can you give us an idea of, uh, you know, maybe some of your either better months or, you know, how, how was it going maybe at its peak with eBay? Was it enough for you to uh, quit your job and do that full time? At the time of uh, quitting my job, it wasn't enough. It, was, it would be, certainly be enough to live, you know, somewhere like where we're living now quite comfortably. But um but, but what happened is we got to that point. I got to that point where I had to make a decision either, uh, you know, I let the, let the Air Force move me or I join with civilian and get on this course or, or basically I quit my job and follow this. Um, and I chose to quit, quit my job and follow this. It still wasn't at the point, though, where you could live comfortably in Australia. I mean, the cost of living in Australia is now one of the highest in the world. And um, But, again... There was enough there. There was a seed there that suggested, you know, we could we could build this, and we did. And probably in around about 2008, just before the GFC would have been when we actually uh, sort of hit our peak on eBay, and we were selling about I think 
at our at our peak month was probably October two thousand and eight, and I think that's about seventeen or eighteen thousand dollars worth of jewelry in a month. Very nice, and so um, at, at at what point along uh, the the timeline, if you will, along this history, did you leave Australia and decide to live elsewhere? Well, our first move was to New Zealand, which was in, I think, gosh, 2009, early 2009, so okay. we moved to New Zealand. Okay, and, um, and we're going to dive into uh, that a little bit uh, about the lifestyle that you have now, where you've lived and things like that, um, but eBay became a little bit difficult, as uh, I understand, with fees and uh, just a lot of things happening with eBay. And you s decided to essentially open up your own store, correct? That's correct, yes. And um, so so you, you, you decided to open up your own store, and you also decided to create a one-page niche site, if you will, will uh, really meant to just generate some traffic that you could lead to your online store, correct? That's correct, yes. And so tell me about that first one-page site that you created. Um, you know, a little, obviously I explained why you did that, but how did it go? Well, we, I had, I, to be honest, I can't even remember why, what inspired me to do that in the first place. I had uh, definitely was looking for, for different ways to get traffic to our site and um, I had read about other people doing satellite sites and, and such things and so I thought I'd do the same thing but I really didn't spend any time, I, you know, I think, I think you'd slap me if you, if you found out exactly what methodology I used to find the keywords. I'm pretty sure, <laughs> almost certainly would have looked at broad match results. Right, um, right. <laughs> and then, then I would have looked at the advertiser competition as some kind of search engine competition. So, used on that excellent, excellent, highly successful methodology, uh, I found a keyword which was basically because we sold we sold a couple of different kinds of metals, and we sold one uh, one was titanium and one was tungsten. You know, very specialized metals. Um, I came up with a comparison site just to compare the two. And uh, basically, one day I sat down, just did a HTML site, wrote an article, put it up, totally forgot about it. As in, literally forgot about it for probably six or seven months um, until I started looking at our site and noticing that we were getting some traffic from this site, in, in fact, quite a bit. And so then I went back and installed some analytics on the site because I hadn't even done that. And I uh, found out that, yeah, we we're getting sort of 50 to 100 visitors a day just to that site. Very nice. Uh, and I think that's when I met you, actually. <laughs> so, yeah, you probably at that point um, decided to research a little bit more. You saw you were having some success with that one site. And as you explained to me previously, that got the wheel spinning in your head about actually just making money with these small niche sites rather than using the traffic and uh, leading it to your um, online store, what if you could just monetize and create lots of small niche sites at that point? Um, so, so how did your experience go doing that, building lots of small niche sites? Well, I, I did probably what a lot of people do in that situation who have got a lot of probably too much time on their hands. Um, I went and built something like 30 to 50 sites um, and just, just went crazy um, and ended up not having you know, enough time or, or energy or focus really to, to put enough effort into any one of them. Um, but we did have uh, some success and we certainly, you know, we, we, we made a lot more money than we spent on them. Um, but something along the way did click and we, we kind of have let a lot of those go now uh, purely because we saw the potential of, of using, even as we've seen your evolution go from sort of the, more the niche sites to the authority sites, that's something that we could see would work, you know, exceptionally well in the e-commerce space. Mm -hmm. I mean, more and more I'm starting to realize that, you know, what you say, what we're doing, what 
you know, a lot of the other successful guys are doing is all the same thing. It's just that we're monetizing it in different ways. Uh, and, right. and because our, our sort of history is really a lot about sourcing product. Um, as, even as you just mentioned before, you were saying that, you know, you, you don't even know where to, you wouldn't know where to start to source product from Asia. Whereas to us now, it's just like, it's so easy. <laughs> um, but if everybody else out there is thinking that it's, it's too hard, then that's a, that's a barrier to entry. Um, and we like, we, we kind of like barriers to entry, you know, for things Absolutely. that we don't find too difficult. So, but essentially we're still looking at creating authority sites, you know, with lots of great information, uh, doing keyword, you know, keyword research, keyword research, keyword research, and, um, but then just monetizing it with actual real physical products. Okay. So basically you went from, well, I, I, I guess you initially you had a, an online store. Uh, then experimenting with some ways to generate traffic, you created this small niche site, and then maybe you got a little carried away, like a lot of us do. <laughs> you you built a ton of small niche sites and tried to monetize them with AdSense or other, you know, other ways. Um, but then uh, it really started to click for you that hey, I could be doing proper keyword research and then sourcing products. And actually building a full, you know, niche retail store online, um, using the same principles that I've been using for these small niche sites, but just do it in a more um, effective manner. You know, larger sites. I'm actually selling the product uh, and things of that nature. So, so, so that basically brings us um, to what you're doing now. Now you have about nine retail sites, if I have that. That's correct. correct yes. Um, can you share any of the URLs with us and what products are you selling? Yeah, I can. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll give you actually our, our original site, vergeury.com. If you just, if anybody just goes to Google and types in V-U-R-G-E, you'll find vergeury.com comes up. Um, it is the, the Australian or UK spelling of jewelry. So it's probably just easy to type in V-U-R-G-E. Okay. And uh, thersjewelry.com is our original. All of our others are, are, as I mentioned before, they're all in sort of various stages of development. So, um, and Verge Jewelry is definitely one that you, everyone can go have a look at. Yeah, no, that, that that's good. Um, and so, with with that store, and then the others that uh, you've either built or are building um, right now, those have been enough to support you and your wife. Um, and the lifestyle that you want, correct? Oh, definitely. Yeah, definitely. So, so let's talk about that a little bit. Let's talk about, um, you know, wh where have you lived? What sort of lifestyle has, has these sites been able to give you? Well, um, well, as I mentioned in 2000, early 2009, we first moved to, uh, Christchurch, New Zealand, which was just, um, you know, I, I think we consider that one of our new homes. It's just a, an absolutely beautiful and amazing country. Um, we were there for the, the Christchurch 7.2 earthquake, <laughs> which was interesting, but, I'm sure um, it was, yeah. but, but again, we, we just absolutely loved the place, but, uh, we then had, uh, we moved back to us. We were lived there for two years and then moved back to Australia for about 12 months, uh, just to help somebody else with their business that they were doing there. And after that, uh, earlier this year in January, we, uh, sort of at the end of last year and the start of this year, we took about three months off and basically just sort of spent a fair bit of time with our family back in Australia before coming over and we just sort of um, stayed on an island for a while in Thailand just because that's what you do uh, before moving to, uh, to Bangkok. And since then, my wife has won the, she's won the Alibaba.com Female Ambassador of the Year so that means that she's been off back to Australia several times and off to China speaking there and, and a few other things. So it's been a, a very busy year. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, so, so both you and your wife are, are working on, on the business together then. Yes. I mean, while we're being romantic, I actually registered our very first business name the same day that I took her on our very first date. <laughs> Is so that right? 
very much a journey together yes <laughs> it's definitely meant to be it sounds like um so let, let's get back to um the, the the sites that you've built a little bit um can you give us any sort of either profit or traffic numbers um that, that the sites are generating um, just to give us an idea of, you know, how many visitors do you need to a site to, for it to do or, or to be successful? Yeah, for sure. I mean, Verge, Verge, for instance, makes sort of around net profit around about the 500 a week mark, so sort of between two and three grand a month. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been doing that for years. When we're on eBay, I, I will preface that though. One thing to important to remember with that is that, for instance, when we're on eBay, we're actually making a significantly higher profit, but we're, we're also working in the business a lot. Mm -hmm. um, we're moving a lot of product, and we're very much real. We learned one thing we did learn there is that, for instance, you can have one site where you're basically spinning the wheels a lot. You might be making more money, but you, there's no possible way you could do anything else. Whereas now we have a site that makes less money, and it's actually a much higher profit margin. And we can now create, we could run 20 or 30 sites. Does that make sense? That does make sense, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's how, how you run, we were actually um, speaking to somebody that she's like, how can you run so many, you know, she's she's running one site and she just had no hours left in the day. How can you run so many and then, you know, go to the gym and spend time by the pool every day as well? Um, mm -hmm. And that really is your perspective on how you start your site and how you want to run your business model. Um, will depend on how many sites you can actually run and then for how much money you can make. Mm -hmm. So what about uh, uh, the visitors that are coming to your site? Uh, about how many, can you give us maybe how many monthly visitors or, or anything like that? Are you willing to share that? Yeah, for sure. Verge is probably at the moment around 50 to 100 a day. So that's, what's that, 1,500 to 3,000 a month. Okay. So not necessarily massively high, but... But generally, you'll find that a lot of people who are searching for these specific keywords, I mean, they're, they're out there looking to buy something. So, um, pretty high quality traffic. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's that's not really a high, um, you know, traffic site, if you will. I mean, that's a good amount, but you know, nothing, you know, huge, um, if nope. you will. But but yeah, the point that you make about it, that it's high quality buying traffic. Um, are you getting uh, most of your traffic from Google then? Yes. Mm-hmm. Nice, definitely. And, um, you know, h how are you ranking your sites, I guess, is is the one thing that I'm sure everybody out there wants to know. I want to know. How, how are you getting that free traffic from Google? What are you doing? Well, I'll be honest with you. A lot of that came, I think, initially. Um, I think we were lucky. I'll be honest with you. I'd love to say that we were very smart. But the reality is, is that we had, um, we I guess we had reasonable content. We had um, we had good titles. We had all that um, going for us. Good descriptions. We had all that going for us without even thinking about it. Whereas we've seen, you know, so many other sites where the, the titling is terrible, the URLs, you know, are basically gobbledygook, uh, all that kind of stuff. Whereas we, I guess, were fortunate in that we we did it right without knowing we were doing it right. In other words, our on-page optimization was very well done and we didn't go crazy with the off-page stuff either. We didn't have, you know, heaps of spammy links or anything like that going to our sites um, and we ranked quite well. We do things a little bit differently these days though with our newer sites. Um, in fact, the only, the only off-page linking that we do now is with uh, actually Matt Leclerc. I think you might have actually mentioned Matt once. Yeah, I'm familiar with uh, Matt. I'm pretty sure actually we probably found him through nichepursuits.com. Okay. One of your earlier posts. And but we don't we don't actually put too much focus on that as much as we do as producing content. Okay, so um, what type of content are you producing? I mean, is it uh, um, all sort of review articles? Um, you know what 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 type of content is there? Because obviously you've got the the product that you're selling as well. Um, so are these unique articles that you're writing as in addition? Very much so. We write a lot of 
um, all of our new sites, for example, are, are very blog focused. You won't necessarily see that when you go to the site. Um, one problem with with e-commerce sites is that uh, you know, as we like to say, Google's a bit of a bit of an oxymoron when it comes to to e-commerce sites. Um, you know, when people are typing in a product to Google, Google wants to give them relevant, you know, results. Mm-hmm. Basically, you know, somewhere where they can go find out about the product and, and hopefully buy it. But Google then wants lots of content on your site. And there's nothing worse than going to an e-commerce site about a product and just seeing words everywhere. Uh, people just want to see a great image. And they want to see a few dot points about the product. Um, but the last thing, it's, you know, all, all the SEO experts come to us and say, yes, we can rank your site. All you need is four to five hundred words in the first, you know, top half of each of your product pages. Uh-huh. <laughs> I mean, that's just ridiculous. I mean, that would be the lowest converting site you can have. True. But, but you still need to have that content. You know, you've got to have that content on your site, and we do that through having a blog. And basically, we just do we do a lot of keyword research, and we create, I think, what other people call what we call a keyword map uh, for that site. Uh, and yes, we use long tail to go and find those keywords. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and we also obviously have a look at the competition for those keywords as well. And so we write articles based around those keywords. But we we obviously keep the the articles helpful, uh, well and well written as well. Okay, absolutely. So are you finding that most of your traffic is coming to those blog articles or your product pages? A bit of both, a bit of both. Uh, we have the other thing that we do with our e-commerce sites is we keep our categories quite um, keyword focused as well. For example, when you go to one of our sites, even when you go to verjury.com, you'll see search by size or you'll see search. And this won't actually be a search box to actually, you know, make the links in the menus. Uh, and we also have, um, I think, you know, search by material. And what that does is it creates all these category names and uh, actual category pages, which are quite keyword specific as well. For example, if you're going to create a, a t-shirt site selling t-shirts, you know, you might have a, you might, you might, you, you want to have links where somebody can search for red t-shirts. I mean, that's not only helpful for your visitors, but it also creates category pages that are very, very specific. You know, if someone's hunting for a red t-shirt, Google can then go to your category page and say, hey, this is a, this page is about red T-shirts. Whereas if you've got some fancy thing on your site where they, they, you know, they find a T-shirt and then they can just click on a flash thing and choose a color, that's great. That helps the customer, but it's no good for Google because Google doesn't know what you're doing. Mm-hmm. Um, so little things like that can make a big difference, particularly in the early stages when you're not really ranking for your primary keywords, but you can still rank for those long tails. Right. Now that makes sense. Um so maybe you can walk us through what the life cycle of a typical niche e-commerce site is. Now that you have, you know, about nine of them up and running, um, you know, how do you start? I mean, do you decide first on a product that you want to sell or, or what's some of those initial steps you take? Uh, we, yeah, we, we try never to have a product in mind. Okay. We really, um, it all comes down to... Is there a market for it first? And the only way to find that out online, as far as I'm concerned, is keyword research. And uh, coming up with product ideas can just be as simple as walking down the aisles in, in your local department store or, or jumping on Amazon and just fishing down through categories and, and coming up with a whole bunch of seed keywords. And then um, and basically you know, using something like Longtail to, to process those keywords and, and just start hunting for... So basically, we do, we do like smaller items, uh, particularly smaller products, and it's not so much from a shipping perspective, it's a storage and logistics perspective. Okay. Uh, as I said, we like to have lots of, you know, lots of different businesses and lots of different products, which is fine, but if you've got a store, you know, if you're selling, I don't know, desks or safes or something, you know, you need to have a, <laughs> you'll need to have a lot of storage space to actually be able to handle right. that those. So we look for the smaller items, and but basically it more comes down to traffic volume and the competition. They're the two biggest things as far as selecting a product. Getting a getting actually sourcing any product from Asia, particularly smaller products, is just so easy. It's ridiculous. So we're not we don't actually worry about the, 
the sourcing so much as, 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 we, as we worry about the actual traffic and the competition. Very interesting. So, I mean, it sounds like essentially you're doing the same type of research that I would do when I want to go out and just create a new niche site. Um, I, you know, I don't think of a topic that I want to build a site on first. Um, I, you know, do some keyword research. I'll jump into Longtail Pro or, well, really initially I'll do some brainstorming like you mentioned, you know, maybe walk down the, the aisle of a store and write down some seed keyword ideas or do lots of other uh, brainstorming activities. And uh, it really comes down to keyword research, it sounds, where you're finding, hey, is there people searching on Google? Is there a market there? And are people buying this product? And then, of course, you're filtering based on, is this a big or a small product? You know, things that I could actually source and sell online. So um, that, that's pretty interesting, um, is that it, it really starts, and that's smart. Um, you know, absolutely very smart the way you're doing is, hey, we got to find a, a good market first. Is there low competition second? Um, and then let's get a product and sell it. Yeah, I mean, I mean, let's face it. This is this is not new business sense in many ways. I mean, this is how business has been done for thousands of years. Sure. Uh, are there people looking for the product, and what's my competition like? Um, it's just, I guess, how we do that is has changed, but but the actual basic business principle hasn't. Yeah. No. Absolutely. And I mean, yes, it's been done for maybe thousands of years, but there also have been millions of business owners that don't do that basic research first that no, don't get me started <laughs> yeah you know that they they go out and they build a business and think you know this is be the greatest thing ever you know come to find out nobody's searching for it or there isn't a market there or it's too difficult of a market and i'm i'm sure i could get you started <laughs> um about quite quite a few things and, and you know we're going to talk about uh, the blog that you and your wife have here in a minute um, where maybe some of those things will come out. But but first, let's stay on here about the life cycle of the niche e-commerce site. So sure. you, you, you do this research, um, you find a product to sell, and um, you know I was going to ask you about where you find the products, but you say now that you've figured out the process, you know being able to source that in Asia is fairly easy for you. Um, yep. t to do. Um, is, is there any pointers that you can maybe give somebody like me that knows nothing about sourcing products? W you know, w where should I get started learning about something like that? Well, the, I guess the general direction, I, I should preface that. I mean, it, it's it's easy now for us now that we've sort of learned the process. So we, we certainly made plenty of mistakes in the beginning when it comes to sourcing product. Right. Um, right. There's definitely a filtering process that you have to go through, uh, but once you sort of learn, you've done that a couple of times, and it does become a bit easier. So what we'll do is um, we use, I guess the two main sites that we use is Alibaba.com. You know, it's the biggest uh, sort of, I guess, directory of, of suppliers in the world, I think, now. Um, and there's also, they've got a spin-off site called AliExpress.com. A lot of people don't know about AliExpress.com, but it's a place where I guess some of your suppliers on Alibaba.com go to sort of basically sell their, their, their oversells or their runoffs or just sort of samples. So it's a place where you can get basically low volume. That's what it's designed for. You might pay a little bit more per product, but you can get low volume product there. So that's a that's a good place to start. Okay. The biggest mistake okay. I think people make when they when they're trying to find product or getting it from Asia is they just buy way 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 too much. Um, they'll go to a manufacturer and the manufacturer will say, "Sure, we'll give you you know we'll give you this for for two dollars and you can sell it for a hundred dollars, but you'll have to buy ten thousand of them." <laughs> and people get trapped by going, "Oh wow, two dollars, a hundred dollars. Wow, that's so cheap. You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna sell them all kind of thing," and then they just they just the, the capital risk is 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 massive, yeah, and that's the opposite of what they should be doing. Right now, that's some right. some good advice. Yes, yeah, so just some quick tips is is yeah, have a look at AliExpress.com if you can't find the product, then go to Alibaba.com and contact as many suppliers of that particular product as you can, and always start with samples. Um, you can actually start a whole business based on samples. You know, your initial site can be just based on samples from a number of different suppliers. 
So not only are you not spending a lot of money, but you're actually testing your suppliers mm-hmm. or getting initial range to test the business. So you don't need to necessarily spend lots of money. You don't need lots of product. Um, there are definitely ways to get started cheaply, easily, and also while you're testing who, who's my final supplier going to be. And now just a follow-up question on the, on the products, and maybe this shows my ignorance or, you know, maybe this is a bad question. I don't know. But are you um, storing the product yourself? Um, you know, is the supplier shipping that to you and then you're storing it until you sell it? Or is it a drop ship type relationship um, where they, the supplier is shipping it directly? How does that work? No, we store it. We have a, a little warehouse in Australia. Okay. Um, got somebody that runs it for us. And we have tried drop shipping in the past, but because we sort of run for it, we, def- we kind of want the, the really high quality product because we want to be able to sell things for a bit more than other people do. Um, we just found that drop shipping was just a little bit too risky. We, n- we need to check the quality ourselves and we, we make sure that that happens before we ship to the customer. Okay. No, that's good to know. Um, now, I, I do want to ask a little bit more about the marketing for your business. We've talked about the free traffic you're getting from Google. Is there anything else that you're doing to, to market your sites, market your business overall? Definitely. I mean, particularly in the early stages of when you launch your site, as you know, some sites can take, you know, months. We, we actually say that you know, if we put up a site, we don't expect anything from it for a year as far as sort of natural search traffic is concerned. I'd, to be honest, I'd probably be disappointed if I had to wait that long, but mm-hmm. that's what we tell ourselves, you know, that's what we're prepared for. Um, but early on, you can get, obviously, you can get a long trail traffic coming through pretty quickly uh, for some businesses. But we also, we found Pinterest is quite good for getting early traffic. Um, Pinterest, if people haven't used it, is very much, a, you know, it's the biggest social media platform for imagery where people can go through different sites and go, oh, you know, I like that scarf or I like this one. And they basically just collect these images on their Pinterest board. And um, definitely, you know, it's something that women use a lot. It's something that I just don't understand at all. Um, yeah, me neither. Hey, yeah, traffic, me neither. So I can't complain. So that's a good one. You know, Facebook's still good. Twitter, not so much. Uh, we still use it for more of an automatic posting for sort of, I guess, if something goes up on our blog or Facebook, it'll just go to our Twitter site. Um, but the other one for retail is comparison shopping. Um, comparison shopping can be quite good you know, for the initial stages as well. But once again, once the site starts getting natural traffic, we, would, we can all of that paid traffic. Now, now, maybe uh, maybe explain what do you mean by uh, com- comparison shopping? Um, sure. Traffic? Um, comparison shopping sites, it depends on what, which country you're in, but um, every country has its own sort of range of comparison shopping sites. Um, shopping.com, which is owned by eBay, that seems to be in just about every country. But, mm-hmm. but essentially what they are is they, they, they aggregate a lot of different suppliers in one area. So it, ha- it allows customers to go and have a look at what a range of different stores are selling and what prices they're selling them at. So it's good for the customer that they can quickly look at it, a bunch of different stores and see what prices they're selling them for. So is that pretty easy to for somebody to get on? Um, you know, if you have a, a new e-commerce site to get your site listed there? It is, but it does depend on each individual site. They, okay. they all tend to run things a little bit differently. Um, I found with shopping.com, they're just, they're a bit of a nightmare. Uh, as far as getting on board with them, but a lot of the others, you know, all you need to do is contact them and they'll, they'll basically assign you a, a representative and that representative will help you build your feed and they'll review it and um, they actually generally make things pretty easily easy for you. But again, they've all got very different click-through rates as well um, and you really, if you're going to do this, it's a good idea for your first site to just basically register with all of them and uh, see which ones work for you. But, but generally, compared to something like AdWords, um, people people have already seen the product, they've already seen your price, and often they've already seen your shipping policies as well before they even click through to your site. So mm-hmm. it's okay. much higher converting, for instance, than say just Facebook ads or, or Google AdWords. 
Some, no, that's some great advice. Uh, so if there's anybody out there listening that wants to start their own retail site, I, I think you've given them quite a bit of information on how they could get started. Is there anything else you would offer as far as how they could educate themselves or anything like that to get started? I think I think the, the, the change of mindset into starting to look at an e-commerce site, people have to go through the same change that we did. In that, when you when people traditionally think of an e-commerce site, they just think of a site, you know, with with products on it. Um, when really it needs to be an authority site with products attached to it. Does that make sense? It's absolute sense. Yep. Yeah, I, I know to you that would just make perfect sense. But I guess when people come to the, the you know, they come straight, they just think of it. Oh, I'm, I'm going to have a retail store, but it's going to be online. And um, and unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. You're basically, if you're getting into this business, you're getting into the content production business in many ways, and people need to be aware of that. Yep, absolutely. And I know that you interact quite a bit with other, uh, you know, online store owners. Um, and you and your wife now have the blog. It's talkingbusiness.com. Um, and, and I'll list this in the show notes uh, for everybody if they want to check that out. But um, what's the overall purpose of, of TalkingBusiness.com? Um, you might find this humorous, but the, but the initial, what happened essentially when Tess was speaking at one of the conferences and the, she was talking to a, a lady afterwards, and this lady had spent, I forget how much it was, it was five figures on product. Uh, lots and lots of money and uh, you know she's still working a job she's not rich or wealthy in any way um, but she had done she had no idea what keyword research even was uh, and we've, we've just been seeing a lot of this happen in, in, in many respects talkingbusiness.com initially started not to help people make you know millions of dollars online but um, in many ways just to stop them spending so much money without doing their, their actual <laughs> research first right help I mean, them avoid mistakes crazy. Yeah, I mean, and we just get so many people. We're still talking to people. Even yesterday, we had a, uh, found out that uh, somebody that we knew basically had, you know, they, they're spending all this money and they're, they're running with this product that they want to sell. Um, and they're, they're following, you know, the process in our book. They're following everything except the keyword research and the competition research. But they're happy with everything else. Hmm. And I did, I did some keyword research for them, for their product. And it's getting 91 visitors, uh, searches per month. Ouch. 91. And you just, and they're spending all this money on product for a site that's getting 91 searches per month. Yeah. <laughs> Not good. Yeah. It's frustrating. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there's so much opportunity. That's the problem. You know, there is so much opportunity. And, but people get focused on what they want to sell. Yeah, and so, so that's a, a lot of what the site uh, that you do there is is talk about what you've learned and and how you can help others maybe getting started, and uh, you know you you also have a, a book out there that is selling on Amazon um, that uh, offers a lot of this basic advice that that we've talked about here. What's the book called, and how can people uh, pick that up? It's called Retail Rebellion, and it's just available on Amazon if you just type in Retail Rebellion. Um, and it's basically, yeah, it's our business model. Um, it's, it's, it's all the things that you need to cover if you, if you intend to get involved with selling products online and, um, if from product sourcing to keyword research, competition research, branding, uh, even logistics and things like that. So it's basically our, our business model in a book. Yeah, no, that's uh, that's very interesting. I, you know, I haven't picked it up yet, but I just might have to because um, I've always been uh, very uh, curious, if you will, to to try out um, doing a physical product, uh, doing an e-commerce store. Um, you know, I have the background as far as keyword research and competition analysis, but um, I haven't uh, dove into trying to actually sell a product. Um, so. That's something I've always wanted to do, so I may have to check that out. Well, very good. You um, certainly got a leg up on most people that actually want <laughs> to, to do it. So. 
No, thank you. But um, so is is there anything else that uh, you'd like to mention to people that are either trying to get started or any other just business lessons that you've learned that you'd like to share with people listening in today? Yeah, I guess one of the, the big ones is, or one of the other concerns, you got to make sure it's passive. I, I, we probably don't have on this enough, but Trying to make your business, it's so easy with, say, a physical product to start doing everything yourself. Um, but if the, the biggest key to doing what we're doing, and you've done it in the past as well, is being able to replicate what you're doing, let it go, let it run, and, and build build more. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, so it's tempting just to do everything yourself all the time. Um, but the other thing, too, is with product, is just don't spend, you don't need to spend lots and lots of money on product to get started. You really don't. And finally, I mean, the biggest one, and I, my wife always gets upset at me because I say this all the time, but do your keyword research. Mm-hmm. Um, this is what people This is what people are typing in. This is what they're looking for. This is what your customers want. And, and they're the ones that are going to make your business successful or not. Absolutely. I think uh, that is some great advice. Um, for everybody out there listening that might have an interest in going into starting an online retail store, even for myself, if I decide to do that uh, in the future. So I appreciate your time very much uh, today, Nathan. Um, oh, you're can, welcome. Yeah, where, where can people follow along with what you're doing? Well, talkonbusiness.com is, is probably the best place to do that. It's where we just keep people updated. I mean, that's what we... Whenever we try something new or experiment with something new on our sites, we, we discuss there what's working and what's not. So we're just trying to basically just keeping that open and honest with whether it's working or whether it's a complete failure. So um, that's probably the best place to, to stay in touch. No, that sounds good. So that's talkingbusiness.com for anybody that wants to follow along with what Nathan is doing. Um, Nathan, I appreciate your time so very much. Uh, getting up early there in Thailand to make some time for me. I appreciate it. Hey, you're most welcome, Spencer. Thank you very much.